Hello and welcome everyone. This is the first of our webinars on ruptured histories. My name is Karen Fonse and I'm going to be moderating and kind of organizing all the speakers and making sure everyone's on time, hopefully. Um, before we begin, I've just got a few announcements to make. Number one is that all people not speaking, and this is very important, must please make sure their microphones are muted. Um, and cameras can stay off until discussion time as well. Uh, number two, the meeting is being recorded and the recording will be available on YouTube. Um, but anybody who's uncomfortable with being recorded in this as part of this meeting must please feel free to keep your, your camera off or change your screen name or blur your background or whatever you would like to do. Um, the third point is if you have any questions, please will you make use of the chat box, which is at the bottom of the screen and put your questions in there so that we can collect them um, for the question time at the end of the presentations. Um, and now I think that's all the announcements. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the president, the president of ICA, Lisbeth Ribello Gonsalves, who um, is going to do a welcome to all of you. And just as a little bio, I would like to give you, she is a full professor at the Art and Communication School of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. She was director of the Contemporary Art Museum of the University of Sao Paulo from 1994 to 98, and again from 2006 to 2010. She has also been president of the Brazilian Association of Art Critics for a total of 12 years up to 2015, and for more than 20 years, she has been curating exhibitions and participating as a jury member in national and international commissions. She has also published many books and articles in specialized magazines throughout her, her career. So, uh, Liz, um, Lisbeth, it's over to you to do the welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I want to say good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on the, which part of the world you are. I am very much pleased to greet you all at the opening of this very important webinar, which is the result of a project led by a group of colleagues from different parts of the world. And I want, I always like to stress this because this is a very important uh, uh, point to have in mind. Uh, we have colleagues from Germany, from Netherlands, from Italy, France, Pakistan, South Africa, and Paraguay. Uh, this group works together at a fellowship fund committee of ICA International and decided to invest in a research about decolonization. Ruptured History Project hopes to bring together a multiplicity of stands of the debate on decolonization, investigate and comparatively analyzing the different viewpoints present all over the world. I congratulate the group through uh, Robert Jan Miller, uh, Jock De Wolf, who were the, the, the colleagues who organized this, uh, uh, this webinar from today, and through Daniel Perrier, who is the chair of the Fellowship Fund Committee. I want to greet the lecturers who participate in this first webinar of the project, and to welcome the audience, thank you to be present. I'm sure the debates of today's webinar will be meaningful for all of us. Thank you and have a good debate. Thank you very much, Lisbeth. And now I see um, Danielle has actually joined us by the skin of her teeth. So it gives me great pleasure to also introduce Danielle Perrier, Chair of the Fellowship Fund Committee, who is an art historian, the founding director of the Ludwig Museum Koblenz, and writer on modern and contemporary art. She's a regular contributor for different German art magazines um, and an, ed an editor of numerous publications. She is also president of ICA Germany and a member of the committees on censorship and freedom of expression, Congress and publications and languages of ICA International. And it's over to you, Danielle, 
to introduce the project. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. I am very happy as chair of uh, ICA International Fellowship Fund Committee to present to you this, the first part of a project developed by our committee as a first contribution to current and topical debates within art institutions and art critics. With a series of webinars summarized under the title of uh, Ruptured Histories, Critical Exchange on Issues of Decolonization, we aim to bring together a multiplicity of stands of the global debate of colonization to enable uh, to us to investigate the discourse from different geographical and cultural vantage points. The awareness created by activist critiques of post-colonial debates and subaltern studies has today evolved into proactive decolonization to address a multiplicity of issues. In this context, I think it is most important to realize that decolonization has a history beyond the 21st century academic discourse and critical practice, as it has long been an integral part of the anti-colonial resistance and a vital part of the national consciousness of post-colonial nations. The diverse narratives reflecting these different geopolitical contexts engage art history, theory, art criticism, and curatorial projects to generate new and diverse angles of thought on the issue. We hope that these discussions will help building a common ground of understanding for a mutual awareness of the abundance of the diverse cultural identities. I would like to conclude by thanking Nilo for Farouk and Anselmo Villata for developing the general concept of ruptured histories. And of course, Joe Kedewolf and Robert Jan Müller for the context, concept and organization of this first webinar on decolonization in the museum, interrogating the history of slavery. Let me now introduce Karen von Fee that you already know from her, Professor of Art History and Theory in the Visual Art Departments at the University of Johannesburg. Her areas of research include transgressive religious iconography, gender and post-colonial and post-apartheid studies. She will now present the theme, the speakers and lead this panel. Karen, thank you. It's up to you. Thank you, Danielle. I'm glad you got here on time. So Hi. am I. <laughs> it was ad ad an adventure, I must say. <laughs> Sounds like it. Right. What we're doing today is looking at the first topic in our webinar series, and it's called Decolonization in the Museum, Interrogating the History of Slavery. Now, this revolves around two topical exhibitions, the 2018 exhibition Afro-Atlantic Histories at the Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo, or MASP, and the 2021 slavery exhibition at the Rakes Museum, which was the first ever exhibition on slavery focusing on the Dutch colonial period of 250 years. Now, the curators of these two exhibitions Adriana Pedrosa from MASP and Valika Schmolders from Rake's Museum will elaborate on the choices that they made when they put these exhibitions together, what sort of audience they were addressing, how to tell stories of people who had been deprived of everything, including the right to their own name. And what is the role of contemporary art in the exhibition? And what was the impact on the audiences? What was the critics response? Um, and really, what is the place of decolonization, that sort of imperative in the contemporary museum? Um, after they've spoken, 
We will have two expert respondents, Anthony Bogues from the Center of the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University, and Babakar Mbai Diop, who is the chair of ICA Senegal and director of the 11th Dakar Biennale. Um, we will give the two speakers a chance to respond to the respondents. And after that, um, we will open the floor to everybody who's here who may either ask questions verbally at that stage or put them in the chat box at the bottom of the um, screen while the speakers are speaking so that we can collect questions to ask them um, after everybody's spoken. Right, now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Valika Schmoinders, who is going to be our first speaker. Um, she is head of the Department of History at the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam, and she specializes in the colonial past and its representation um, in and museums and museum audiences. She has published on the Dutch slavery past in the Netherlands, Curacao, Suriname, St. Martin, Ghana, and South Africa, and on Caribbean heritage in Dutch museums. She was a member of the Dutch Commission on Colonial Collections of the UNESCO Memory of the World Committee in the Netherlands, gave the sixth Rudolf van der Leer Lecture at the University of Leiden, and received the Black Achievement Award in the category of Education and Science. So that, after that very impressive resume, I may I ask you, Valika, to begin your presentation now. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for that beautiful introduction. And thank you, Aika, for the invitation to be able to uh, share my work with you, the work of the museum. I'm uh, really excited and looking forward to um, your reflections on all of this. Let me work on sharing my screen with you. How is that? Is the screen there? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Yes. Okay, well, good afternoon to you all. Um, and what is important to know is what Karen already mentioned is that the Rijksmuseum is the Dutch National Museum of Art and History, and it had never ever before uh, done an exhibition on slavery. Uh, so this was a, a great adventure to all of us. Between the 17th and the 19th century, in the area around the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, under Dutch rule, people were forced into slavery. This past is looked upon from very different standpoints. In the media in the Netherlands, we see that for part of the country, it is a past that is foreign and long ago. But for others, it is a past that is very much alive a past they feel it is necessary and urgent to learn more about. The Rijksmuseum was well aware of this discrepancy when head director Taco Dibbets announced in 2017 that the museum would present an exhibition on slavery. This is history that can be seen as divisive, but it is also history that can be used as an instrument to unite, to build cohesion. The Rijksmuseum knew that to organize this exhibition, it was imperative to bring in multiple voices. To start out, the museum saw to it that the team of curators that would bring together the exhibition would be diverse in both their professional and personal backgrounds. In this way, we could complement each other's knowledge and we could also question each other. We organized a think tank, again, with an array of specialties. In addition, we invested in, or in conversations with many individual contacts, people who contributed to our work with their academic research, varying from historical to anthropological and even biological. Our expertise in genealogical research, oral history or religion. It was a challenging assignment for all who worked on it to construct an exhibition people could recognize themselves in about an inconceivable system buried in the past, a system in which people were turned into objects by law. It was the state that permitted human trafficking from generation to generation. This was legitimized by othering parts of the world's humanity, 
by pointing towards differences in skin color, features, religion. This way, ideas were created that until this day still play a role in our actions, in our thinking. This often subconscious ongoing legacy substantiates the reason and urgency of this exhibition. It also explains why it is so important to realize an exhibition centered on people, on human stories, historical figures, and all of their courage, resilience, and greatness, but also all of their fears, egoism, and failures. Universal human traits all of us can relate to. What would you or I have done when confronted with these circumstances? This exhibition is about a period in which injustice was legalized. It is about those who profited from the system, those who suffered by it, and those who spoke out against it. In a sense, you could say that it is about perpetrators and victims, but by adding the layers of individual lives, a human be being becomes so much more than his circumstances, more than one facet of their identity. Their stories become universal. The exhibition follows 10 lives, all true stories. This individual approach speaks about individual roles within a larger system. What is the influence of a singular human being? What is needed to recognize injustice and to fight it? The first five stories help understand how the system itself worked. The second five are all counter voices, people with different backgrounds, um, who throughout the 250 years that the system lasted, dared to be free, independent thinkers. The first story focuses on how people were dehumanized and taken away from their familiar surroundings and network, following Joao to, from Africa to Brazil. The second introduces the plantation system through the life of Vali in Suriname. The third and fourth stories bring us back to the Netherlands. First, we see the life of the elite in Amsterdam through opium Kopit. Then the life of Paulus, a young man from Africa who is legally free in the Netherlands, but who is otherized by the use of a metal collar. The fifth story, the story of Van Bengale, shows us all of these characteristics of colonial slavery, how they worked under the VOC the uh, Dutch uh, East India Company around the Indian Ocean. The counter voices from different parts of the world are from different parts of the world as well. We start with Surapati in Indonesia, who fought to oust the VOC. Sapali, who fled slavery and became the founding mother of a new society in Suriname. Tula in Curaçao, who led a rebellion against the system. Dirk van Hogendorp, who wrote and spoke about abolition in Indonesia, but changed his mind when at the end of his career, he started a plantation in Brazil. Loke inspired entire plantations in St. Martin to escape. So many men, uh, people fled that the island's plantation owners had no choice but to end the system in 1848, 15 years before the abolition was finally legalized. These last five stories allow us to take a critical look at the process of abolition and finally the meaning of freedom. To bring these stories to the museum, we needed objects, of course. Um, in our own collection, we had a lot of objects that are related to power and wealth, which we needed to reinvestigate. By putting them in this exhibition, we reframe these objects. Let me give you a few examples. The one on the left top corner, the golden box, was always displayed as art. But if you look closely, it also includes a picture of human trafficking. A second um, example is Opium Coppet, who I just spoke about, the woman on the top. She's a magnificent painting done by Rembrandt, and she allowed us to question the female role in this history. What did she know about her fa family's involvement in slavery through the sugar industry? 
But we also needed to bring in new objects that were not present in our collection yet that could speak to the reality of the enslaved. One example is the sugar kettle you see on the left in the middle. So we could speak about the work done on the plantations. Another one is um, the footstock we brought in on the top, uh, on the left-hand side, to speak about the violence of the system through uh, objects like these. Now, uh, research into our own collection also brought us new insights and new stories we were able to bring. The one that uh, is closest to my heart is the one uh, about the metal collar, which you see on the right hand side, uh, a bit to the middle. This metal collar, a lot of museums in the Netherlands have them, they were always categorized as dog collars. But a different reality was actually hidden in plain sight. Because if you look closely on paintings of the 17th century, it was clear that these collars were never worn by pets, but they were always seen on the necks of young African men. One example you can see is this bust that we loaned from uh, the United Kingdom with the, uh, from the African men. And you can see the collar on his neck. So it gives us a completely new insight into the experience of the very first Afro-Dutch people. Um, they were people who were um, legally free in the Netherlands, but at the same time, they were uh, kind of branded through the use of these uh, metal collars. Um, we discovered other things in our own collection as well, like this drawing on the right-hand side on the um, uh, bottom. This is Toussaint Louverture, who was the first black leader of Haiti, and it allows us to speak about the resistance and what was visualized in the Netherlands. Who did we portray as heroes and who were the people that were left out, who was never portrayed? And historical objects uh, do not suffice, of course, to address the experience of being displaced, dehumanized, being transformed into an object, a working tool. That is why we needed to bring in contemporary art as well, which we did through the objects you see on the right side uh, on the top, a huge um, uh, display done by uh, uh, Hazoumé called La Bouche du Roi. It fills an entire gallery and it speaks about the experience of people uh, in the galleys of the ships and how they were uh, transported from one end to the, of the world to the other end to end up uh, working on plantations there. So one controversial decision done by the museum was that we wanted to use not just um, the sources that uh, we normally use for uh, our exhibitions, not just objects and archival uh, um, objects, but we wanted to bring in other kinds of disciplines as well. So what you see here is me in the Our Depot speaking to oral history experts, speaking to a biologist, and um, in the story of Sapali, all of this research comes together. Oral research was actually proven correct by DNA research. According to oral history, Sapali smuggled rice so she and others could escape slavery and survive of their, on their own. And by bringing in maps uh, we had of, our, of this area, and by studying the notes of soldiers in search of refugees like Sapali, everything kind of came together. It shows the value of bringing different types of knowledge together. And I have to mention one thing that was really important to us, the exquisite design of the exhibition done by Afaina de Young. Uh, our building very much speaks about uh, the national story of power and wealth. It was never supposed to convey the story of those uh, who were um, um, was oppressed and left out. So the building was very much not a blank canvas. And Afaina used these vibrant bright colors uh, on the walls that sometimes entrapped the visitors. Uh, uh, she used uh, mirrors to raise questions about what we see, what we don't see. 
um, um, so these questions about who am I, who are the others, who are we, who are we as a society, that's very important. And without them um, raising the questions literally, the design could make that clear to uh, every visitor. Um, the exhibition's audio tour leads the visitor through these 10 stories. And for each of the stories, we found a descendant or somebody who was close to uh, this history, who has a, sh uh, a shared similar history. They add a personal relevance to the stories and show that the past is not behind us yet. It lives on in the present. We know that this exhibition was about a subject that um, had been underrepresented in museums, something that led to a fierce public debate. We knew that our visitors would be touched by this exhibition, that it would uh, lead to all kinds of emotions. So we aim to bring in, and, and we very much aim to bring in more descendants from enslaved people that never visited the museum before. So for all these people, we wanted a space to be able to reflect on the exhibition. We wanted people to feel they are not just visitors, but also not just consumers, but also co-producers of the exhibition. So we did that through participatory art. These artists and their team helped lead the dialogue after the visits, building 10 new sculptures with the, our visitors. So in the, ex, in the uh, reactions, you can see that people are very touched. They are very empathetic towards those who suffered. Uh, and that they still feel that its history should be part of, uh, or, or some other people uh, also mentioned that they feel that it should be part of the past, that uh, it should not be talked about, that we should leave it in the past. But that group is um, uh, a much smaller group than the group that is opened up a lot more to this uh, topic now. So two of the uh, sculptures, for example, are the one uh, about João. João is the person who is brought from Africa to Brazil. Um, so that is the very basic story of uh, slavery. And you can see in the reactions that people have been able to think about that longer. So you see in their re reactions that they reflect on the meaning of that history for society today. Um, uh, and their opinions about that. And one of the other sculptures that um, I thought was really interesting was the one of Dirk. Now, Dirk is a man uh, who wrote about abolition, but who changed his mind once it touched his own interests, his own livelihood, uh, once it became uh, more personal to him, what was at stake. So in this sculpture, people get to reflect and go within themselves to really look in the, in the mirror. What kind of mask do I wear in current day society? So that was an exciting one as well. So filmmaker Ida Du, she followed the four curators and their process, the making of the exhibition. And so through that documentary, you can see how each of us struggled with different aspects of the past and how to bring this into the museum. Uh, you can see us speaking a lot, questioning each other. So in that sense, our process was the process um, different people could recognize themselves in people in uh, society. So it led to a lot of reactions. Being transparent about our own learning process and questions and doubts and struggles that really helped people uh, let go of the idea that you need to be able to answer all questions. I feel it was a contribution to the acceptance of history being a construct, reflecting our current day questions and the state of the art of uh, our research. Um, we wanted to reflect on our own collection and permanent display as well. So for a long time, the assumption was that collections of the powerful and rich were not suited to speak about slavery. But our research shows otherwise. The objects are full of references to the economy of slavery, links between institutions and slavery, of personal profit from slavery, and to the way Africa and Africans were portrayed in the colonial period. So we added new text in our permanent display, and those texts will remain there for a year. 
after which we hope that uh, they will have led to new insights, which we can also add to our permanent texts and presentations. So the exhibition is closed now, but the 10 stories can still be visited through our video tours, which are available on our website. And part of our program can also be seen there. Our symposium in which we discuss the uses and the use of sources and the talk shows in which different guests dive deeper into their own experiences and insights. For the museum, building the exhibition was really a transformative experience. Every department now has new personnel, new partners, new knowledge, which helps see to it that it is only the first step towards further developments, towards a museum that represents all of the Netherlands. Thank you for it your attention. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That was wonderful. I'm, I'm really blown away by the way your exhibition process was democratic and inclusive and diverse and sensitive and participatory. And every single one of those works, words is the antithesis of the experience of slavery. So your, your, your exhibition is sort of steeped in humanity, which is what the slaves were denied. And I find that very moving. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, can You're I ask very welcome. I'm trying to stop sharing my video yeah. now. It's up at the top. Normally up at the top, you find the, the stop share button. Oh, over there. Okay, there we go. Yes. Great, thank you. <laughs> Right, now we have our second speaker, um, Adriano Pedrosa, who is artistic director of Museo de Arte de, Arte de Sao Paulo, Assis Chateaubriand, otherwise known as MASP, since 2014. Prior to that, he was adjunct co-curator of the Biennale de Sao Paulo from 1998 and 2006 and curator of exhibitions and collections for diverse institutions. Last curator of the 12th Istanbul Biennale and curator of the Sao Paulo Pavilion at the 9th Shanghai Biennale in 2012. At MASP, Pedrosa has organized many exhibitions, including the ongoing series dedicated to different histories, histories of childhood, histories of sexuality, Afro-Atlantic histories, women's histories, feminist histories, and histories of dance. And now I pass you over to um, Adriano, who is, I can't see you on the screen. Oh, there you are. Okay, super. So would you like to share your screen now? Yes, I'll do that immediately. Thank you so much for the introduction. Special thanks to Karen and Daniel and Liz, Dr. Daniel and Lisbeth Hibolo from Sao Paulo, my colleague from Sao Paulo. Always wonderful to share a little bit of our work here with all of you. Um, it's always quite difficult to speak about an exhibition that has over 500 works um, spanning over five centuries organized around eight different sections with five different curators. So uh, this is uh, Afro-Atlantic histories, the stories of Atlanticas, um, for us organized uh, by the Museo de Arte de São Paulo, MASP, the São Paulo Art Museum, and the Tomi Otaki Institute in 2018, both institutions in São Paulo, so the exhibition happen across two different venues in the city. So I will speak um, about the history of the exhibition in terms of where it was coming from, the framework of the exhibition, um, a little bit about the section themselves, but it's really quite fast. So I encourage you to look up online. We have quite a lot in our website. We have quite a lot of images and documentations and text and information on the exhibition itself, and then talk a little bit about its unfoldings as well, which is always quite important for us. Uh, this is MASPI. This is our museum in Sao Paulo. Um, it's a private museum founded in 1947. 
Uh, it's located at the very heart of the most uh, important iconic uh, avenue in Sao Paulo. And uh, I want to call attention to our uh, mission, but just the very first line, you don't have to read it through, but our mission, which was revised in 2018, defines MASPI as a diverse, inclusive, and plural museum. And that will uh, give us the mandate to really try to develop a program around so many different histories, histories that uh, we, mentioned a few histories of childhood in 2016. These are year long programs that we organize. Uh, there is a group show titled uh, histories of childhood, for example, in 2016, sexuality in 2017, but all the different solo shows, monographic presentations, video programs, lectures, talks, workshops, publications, and more are also focused around these particular histories. As you will see, we are more interested in social histories, in histories that can relate to the contemporary rather than art history itself. Art, art history, of course, is a layer, is one layer of, uh, among these many different histories, but our uh, focus has been in these uh, histories that are more informed about the social somehow. And uh, we are now organizing in 21, 22, uh, Brazilian histories uh, to coincide with the, the bicentennial of independence of the country in uh, 2022. Um, I'll go through, there's a, there's a very interesting notion of histories that we have in Portuguese, I think quite different from the English. Historias in Portuguese may encompass fiction and nonfiction. So it really, and particularly when you use it in the plural, as we do, um, it can encompass many diverse types of narratives and accounts. So it's, we're not talking uh, ever about a single history, a final history. It's always a history that's impermanent, that's been revised, that can, uh, can be uh, very polyphonic, contradictory at times. Um, and uh, these exhibitions have become the sort of quite iconic exhibitions, a trademark almost of the museum. And I'm showing you just a few images of uh, one of uh, image of a few of these different histories that we organize. This is histories of childhood. We're always trying to pair uh, works from different contexts, different periods, different generations, different territories. This is our very iconic Renoir on the left and a Barbara Wagner photograph on the right. This is histories of sexuality, the opening wall uh, with uh, Rojas, Bacon, Renoir again, Juan Darla and Miriam Kahn in 2017. This is uh, one of the most sort of emblematic walls of uh, uh, Afro-Atlantic histories in 2018 with the two wonderful pictures of, uh, by Albert Eckhout, the Dutchman that visited Brazil in the 1600s that belonged to the Danish Royal Collection. Um, Afro-Atlantic histories goes back to another important exhibition that we organized. Uh, and I actually should mention already, the names will come up later on, but I should mention the five curators that are involved in Afro-Atlantic history, bes besides myself, Tomas Toledo, chief curator Lilia Schwartz, uh, our adjunct curator of histories, all white curators, I should say. At that time, we didn't have any black curators working in the museum. So we, had, we uh, invite something that has changed since. We invited two guest curators then, Ayrson Heraclito and Elio Menezes. That's already back in 2017. But the exhibition itself goes back to another very uh, important exhibition in terms of these different histories, which is Mestizo Histories, an exhibition curated before I uh, joined Mayatsky by myself and Lilia Schwartz at the Instituto Tomiotaki in 2014, an exhibition look, that looked at mestizaje, the idea of many different uh, uh, mixed histories and ethnicities in Brazilian culture. And um, there's one particular wall with uh, the Emanuel Araujo sculpture on the left, the black, very large scale sculpture on the left, with the Hank Willis Thomas map of Africa replacing South America on the right, that we will in fact uh, mention again 
quoted, as it were, four years later in Afro-Atlantic histories, as you will see in an installation chart. Uh, to begin the project around Afro-Atlantic histories, which of course hops back to this exhibition in 2014, Mestizo Histories, we initiated a number of seminars. And the first seminar we, we, uh, was in 2016. Uh, the year of 2018 was chosen because it was the 130th anniversary of abolition in Brazil. Brazil is the last country to abolish slavery in the West, in the so-called West, <laughs> West of, 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 of uh, the Atlantic. And um, Brazil, of course, plays a central role in the histories of slavery. We received about 40% of the enslaved people that came from Africa to the America over the course of several centuries. Brazil today is considered the second largest African country, only in population, uh, due to its uh, black population, um, only second to Nigeria in Africa. And of course, despite all that, there is still a, a lot of violence and racism in the country. You know? And um, Anyhow, going back to our seminar in 2016, we then typically, as we do in these history, in these programs around these different histories, we organize maybe two, three different seminars in the preceding years in preparation to the exhibition itself. And we really hope to learn from the seminars as we did, particularly in this one. In 2016, so two years, before the exhibition, we were still calling it histories of slavery as with a very harsh imagery on the right, as you can see used. This is the sort of uh, the image that was used for that first seminar in 2016. The following seminar, um, we then reflected upon many of the discussions that came about in that first seminar. I think this is one thing, something that we really, really wanted to uh, that I really wanted to call attention to. And we realized that it was important to, of course, still keep slavery as a central, and the histories of slavery as a central topic. But it was important also to bring in a different framework. And these are critiques that we received during the, during the seminar and afterwards. And that's how we reframe the project as Afro-Atlantic histories. That's already in 2017, a year before the exhibition, we came up with this uh, different uh, framework, which I think was very productive indeed. We really decided, of course, slavery was present in the exhibition, in, 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 the, in the project, in the many programs, the yellow year long programs, but we thought it was really important to move away from that, responding to the critiques and the conversations that we had, right? So the, this is the second seminar. And in fact, uh, a colleague from the Rijksmuseum Museum attended, whose name now, she was the curator of, of histories at the time. She attended this seminar in 2017. I do not recall the name, I'm afraid. That is yes. Evelyn St. Nicolas. You saw her on one of my slides. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Yes. thank you. Yes, she did come. She was just beginning her, her, you know, you all were beginning your project back then. Uh, let me see what's going on here. Oops. All right, so this is the team. Um, as I said, Afro-Atlantic Histories, co-organized, really led by MASPI, but co-organized by MASPI and the Tomiotaki Institute, happened in 2018. This is the, uh, the curatorial team is myself, Ayrton Heraclito, a guest curator from Bahia, Elio Menezes, another guest curator from Bahia, Lilia Moritz Schwartz, our adjunct curator of histories, uh, and Tomas Toledo, our chief curator. And then we published also an anthology with all these, these, these texts that came out in the seminars. This is also a very important part of the project, the publication. And uh, I edit that anthology with Andre Mesquita, who's the curator, um, who's a curator at MASP, and Amanda Cornero, who is now uh, an assistant, assistant curator at MASP. 
And this is, it's running a little bit slow. I did say it seems, sorry. Wow. Oh, there you go. So this is the cover of our anthology, around 600, no, 640 pages. It includes, you know, um, not only presentations that were made during the seminar, but also other key texts that we felt were important. This is a, always a, you know, uh, uh, a publication that we do every year. Um, very popular with the students. And um, this one is already sold out. We're, we're publishing, we're reprinting it. So it's a very important part of the project. Um, I'll show you four, we did four covers of the catalog. Um, these are all sold out. Now we are doing a second one as well. This is one of the front covers, another front cover. third cover and the fourth cover. Um, we had partnerships with a number of institutions that were very generous with us in terms of securing important loans, because of course we had loans coming from all over the Americas as well as um, Africa and Europe. But this particular piece on the cover, for example, um, the, the picture belongs to the National Gallery in Kingston, who were very generous with the loans. Uh, this one on the cover also uh, uh, very generous loans from the Museo Nacional de, uh, in, in Havana, the National Fine Arts Museum in Havana, always a very challenging loan uh, for museums anywhere, but they were very uh, supportive, so we gave them a cover as well, as well as the National Gallery of Art in Washington, where this wonderful picture is coming from on the front cover as well. So now I'll show you a few images of a few uh, installation shots of the different uh, sections of the exhibition, of the eight different sections of the exhibition. Um, the, the, typically, the histories of exhibitions, they are organized, they are not organized chronologically, and they are not organized according to territories or media. So they always are um, framed around different themes and topics, which in fact tend uh, at times to reoccur. Um, this first section, and then, and also when you start to look more closely at the different sections, you'll see that there are a number of overlaps and different works could be, uh, could shift from one section to, uh, uh, to another. So it's not sort of a perfect uh, model. And we find that uh, quite interesting. In fact, there's this idea of bringing something that's critical, historical, but also creative and speculative as well. Um, this is where the idea of the uh, impermanent histories are coming from as well. S histories are in motion, in motion that are alive, that are always um, questioned, as I said, polyphonic and at times contradictory as well. But the, the first uh, section is, um, called Maps and Margins, Mapas e Margins. And you see here again, the middle, um, the middle image, you'll see again, the Hank Willis Thomas uh, sculpture on the left, um, um, US uh, artist that does this uh, cutout ma map on metal painted in black, replacing the image of South America with the image of the African continent. And on the right, um, a senior, uh, very important uh, Brazilian, Black Brazilian artist from Bahia as well, who's working with geometric abstraction and reliefs, but also with references to the African diaspora, religions, and histories in Brazil. 
and this piece is called simply ship, ship referring of course to the slave ship. So this was quite uh, an iconic pairing for us in the very first section, which again was present in the Mestizo Histories exhibition at Tomiotaki in 2014, when we're almost sort of quoting that exhibition four years later at the museum, at the Sao Paulo Art Museum. Um, this is the section dealing uh, with what we called emancipations. Um, that had different representations around struggles for freedom and liberation. The first section was uh, located at Maspi. Uh, Maspi um, hosted six sections and Tomiotaki hosted two sections, two very much sort of related question, uh, uh, sections. So emancipations is also, uh, is a section, the first section, hosted by uh, Tomiotaki, but, and I should say that each of the uh, sections are curated by different curators. This one is curated by uh, Lilia Schwartz, Helio Menezes, Tomas Toledo, and myself. Uh, and of course, representations of uh, struggles for freedom and liberation across the centuries. Then we go back to Maspi. The narrative in the book is quite different from the exhibition, the narrative in the exhibition, because of course you can't, you know, you, you can't travel from one museum like that. They're about half an hour before, uh, half an hour apart. So another section dealing with uh, everyday lives, the day-to-day -day lives of um, Africans and Af Afro descendants uh, across the centuries in the Americas. Um, the installation tends to be, as you can see, quite loaded <laughs> um, and always pairing, uh, making some sort of thematic pairings, um, juxtaposing works that can create sort of frictions around them. Very difficult to go through each, you know, each one of them here. But uh, again, I encourage you to look at the website. We have a lot of, of these images are all there. Um, Rights and Rhythms is also a section that was already present in uh, Mestizo Histories four years ago. Um, we have, of course, images of festivities, images of celebrations, even images of religion, because, of course, these things are all very much interconnected. And, of course, this was uh, uh, a section juxtaposed to everyday lives because of course rights and rhythms are very much part of everyday lives. Um, a section curated by Lila Schwartz, Tomas Toledo and myself at Maspi. This is a very particular question, uh, section, uh, very sort of um, um, outside, it seems almost outside of the framework that we were working. Uh, we invited Daiso Heraclito who is an artist and a writer and a professor uh, living in Salvador in Bahia. And he proposed uh, something again, quite interesting, speculative, also creative and critical at the same time. The, uh, the, the section was called Routes and Trances, Africa, Jamaica and Bahia, looking at try, trying to tr trace connections between Afro-American, uh, religions and visual cultures in these three territories in Africa, Jamaica, as well as in Bahia, through um, Rastafarian references to psychedelia, through uh, black hippies and other movements and, and uh, visual cultures. Um, so that was also uh, hosted by Maspi. A section that we've always done uh, in these different histories is a section devoted to, to portraits. Maspi is uh, well known for its collection, uh, uh, which has strong holdings on figurative art, particularly the representation of the human figure and particularly portraits. And of course, black portraits, uh, you know, all often um, 
uh, not found in fine arts museums. Of course, these things have been changing quite a lot recently, but this is almost a, a section that uh, addressed at the time the lack or the very few numbers. I think we had very, very, very few at that time, uh, numbers of black portraits in our own museum, in our own picture gallery. You know? um, and again, uh, quite a wonderful collection of uh, black portraits across the centuries from the 16th century through the 21st century, including some commissioned works, mostly paintings, but also some sculpture. You know? um, we also thought it was interesting to look at modernism. So what we were calling Afro-Atlantic modernisms. You know? So this is the first time we see, for example, uh, on the top image, you'll see uh, the, the Nigerian Okeke with Hubin Valenchin, Brazilian Hubin Valenchin in the middle, and Alex Bogosian from Ethiopia on the right. So this type of very unusual de de juxtaposition was something that we were trying to uh, develop here. And finally, the section around his resistance and activism, very much related to the section of emancipation, also a section hosted by Tomio Taki. Um, this is, uh, I have a, a couple of minutes almost wrapping up. Uh, this is an image of a banner that was installed by French Treji Freverero that read, where are the blacks? Which is a question really to be asked, not only in Sao Paulo, but also in the institution. And I should say after this, after years, you know, going back uh, to this exhibition, we have developed a very strong presence now of uh, black artists in the collection, as well as uh, colleagues in our curatorial team. We have five colleagues now in our curatorial team. Afro-Atlantic histories will now uh, be um, hosted in uh, October. It starts a new tour. It's a, it's a more concise version of the original exhibition, but it travels to, it starts, opens now in October at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Um, with whom we organize this exhibition, this, this, tour, this tour. It then travels to the National Gallery in Washington, later to the Los Angeles County Museum and the Dallas Museum of Art. So this is you know, almost an afterlife of Afro-Atlantic history. It's now moving from Brazil to the US. And the last image, I, I spoke about the uh, presence very briefly, but uh, the very important presence of um, this exhibition in our own collection, how it really sort of stays. And now the very first row, this is our glass easel display. Some of you might be familiar with it, very iconic glass easel display devised, designed by Lina Bobaji for the museum. The, the pictures are hanging on these uh, glass stands. Um, and uh, the very first row since the beginning of last year, uh, has always been dedicated to black artists, many of which were uh, acquired, uh, almost all of them were acquired over the course of that year in 2018 and afterwards works that were present in the exhibition itself. So we're always trying uh, to make these exhibitions, these different histories exhibition, a really important opportunity to transform the collection, to transform the program, because Afro-Atlantic histories is not over with 2018. It will continue to unfold. Uh, and uh, it's something that we're always thinking about. And I think I'm over my 20 minutes by now. Um, thank you very much. Stop sharing. Thank you very much, Adriana. Yeah. That was fascinating. Um, and I find it quite amazing that it's so rich and so complex um, in all the connections that you made, it's not a neatly categorizable exhibition. It's not, you know, we can fit things in boxes, but I think that's really appropriate for the complexity and di diversity that you find in the histories of the Black diaspora. So, so to me, it, it just exudes that kind of um, richness of culture that you find in the mingling of cultures all over. So thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, right, now we better move on quickly to our next speaker, who is um, Professor Anthony Bogues. And I've just lost my, ah, here we go. Uh, Professor Anthony Bogues, who is the 
ASA or ASA, I don't know how you pronounce that, Mesa Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory and the inaugural director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University, as well as a visiting professor and curator at the University of Johannesburg, where I work. The author and editor of eight books in the fields of intellectual history, political theory, and art. He's currently working on two book projects, one titled Black Critique, and the other on radical dub intellectuals and dread history. He is the co-convener of the exhibition project, Slavery, Colonialism, and the Making of the Modern World, with the National African American Museum of History and Culture. He is a regular columnist for the South African newspaper, Mail and Guardian, and his articles have also appeared in the Financial Times. Um, and he's going to be speaking on history as catastrophe. Now, before he starts, I must just quickly mention that he has to leave in half an hour. So um, when we do questions and things, I hope there will be time for him to at least be around to answer a few of your questions at the end. Thank you, Anthony. It is now over to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, want to thank everybody um, uh, you know, on, on, this, uh, on this program. And just to say, I have to leave because um, the semester opens today. And um, I have to speak to freshmen, incoming freshmen in half an hour. Um, let, me, um, let me begin by saying that, um, that these two presentations were really very interesting. Um, and I would, I, I would comment in towards the end on what I think uh, are different and, I, and important about the exhibitions. The, I want to begin by talking a little bit about history, because I think that the, the title of this uh, webinar is Ruptured History. And I think it's important to think about history, but to think about history, not just as something as in the past or a relationship between the past and the present, but I said, if you are thinking about history of colonialism and histories of racial slavery, then you are talking, thinking about history specifically as what I've called uh, catastrophe. And if you're thinking about history as catastrophe, then the one is also talking about the ways in which those uh, catastrophes and the sedimented deposits of those catastrophes begin to shape, they uh, begin to shape the present. And I want to suggest that questions of history of colonialism and the history of racial slavery is history as catastrophe because A, it is of long jury, that is it lasted a long time. Secondly, that the, it uh, impacts the deep everyday practices of our lives and therefore is not just an, was not just a single event, but a process. And then thirdly, following Raymond Williams, the, uh, the English uh, 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 cultural theorist, to think about the ways it structures, not just societies, but also structures what Williams call the structures of feelings in quotation marks. So that racial slavery and colonial domination falls within this kind of definition of historic, historical catastrophe. I'm not here trying to make a kind of uh, matrix, matrices of the Olympics of suffering, nor to make a special case. Rather, I'm trying to re re uh, re refer to a configuration of historical specificities, a configuration which generates forms of sedimented deposit with structures not necessarily overdetermined, but structures of everyday life. I think it is from this particular kind of definition that one begins to think about the two exhibitions that we have been that we have just uh, that we have just heard um, uh, heard about. I want to begin with the Reichs. I saw the exhibition. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was able to snuck into Amsterdam in the middle of the pandemic uh, for two days, uh, visiting London and then going over to Amsterdam. Um, and uh, this is, I want to talk a little bit about what it is I saw and react to it as somebody who, 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 who um, were in discussions with people, but who also has been involved in trying to think about how to exhibit the, um, the, you know, the, this historical catastrophe and what does it mean uh, to do that? 
the curatorial decisions that about structuring the exhibitions around 10 lives, I thought was really very important because it begins to humanize a set of structures. And therefore, what I think is, is critical is to always think through as, and when thinking around catastrophe as to what it means, obviously, for, the, for human beings. But it also seems to me that the work of the exhibition was not so much to confront or break the kind of thraldom in the, in the Dutch historical uh, understanding of itself, but rather it was to complicate that. And it was to complicate it through looking through the holdings of the museum. So therefore it was a kind of partial decolonization for sure. The question that I asked as I walked through that exhibition was really, um, does the, this job of partial decolonization, does it simultaneously tell the story of racial slavery? In other words, that there is the preoccupation with trying to think through the actual, um, the, 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 the works that are in the ranks of making sure that they are connected uh, to, to slavery. But then I have to ask myself, okay, does that then also tell the story of slavery or does it just complicate the actual holdings that, have, that, 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 that are in the, 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 the museum? And perhaps that's the objective, not necessarily to tell the story of slavery in the Dutch, uh, in, the, in, 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 Dutch in, in, in the Dutch colonial period, but rather to complicate what the museum holdings um, were about. And secondly, as I walk through the exhibition, I ask myself the question of, uh, of violence. How, how, how does it, um, the, the, the history of racial slavery and colonialism is actually a history of violence. And so I asked myself, besides the dark color, which I found very interesting and which is important, and one has to think about what is how, you know, how the dehumanization process and animalization process of black folks means that you call them dogs. So, and you know, it this what struck me was to think about um the, does this really tell the story of violence? And then obviously there is a problem because how do you tell the story of violence without reproducing the violence? So there's, so there's, so I am not critiquing and saying this is what you're supposed to do, but I'm saying there is a deep, there's a, you have to, one has to confront the violence and tell that story of violence without oneself reproducing the violence. And that's a really tricky um, toddling to, to, uh, to, try, to try and do. Because the question that around the, uh, of the, uh, the core of that violence is not just the physical violence, obviously, it is the fact of people being property, Pro the fact of people, of, of people being, uh, you know, the process of what Amy Cizier would call uh, thingification. So I left the exhibition feeling, okay, this is a really um, very important first step in my view, and, and, and a kind of partial, de you know, step of partial decolonization, but but also when are we what 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 are the next steps are there is there going to be uh, how are we going to think about um, rupturing the actual narrative itself right not just complicating the narrative but rupturing rupturing the narrative in other words create a new narrative about the history of of, of Dutch colonialism and Dutch colonial uh, slavery and the other question I had in my mind as I left was there what are the kind of and uh, epistemic challenges they, that, 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 that really shapes one as one is thinking about such an exhibition. And, they, and, and, and when, you, when I say that, what I mean is what is the kind of gaze? Where, uh, what, whose, whose voices are being heard in this exhibition? Um, and and what, what voices do we, what voices therefore do we uh, foreground? And therefore what voices, what is the story in this that, that we tell? But I also want to commend all the curators, quite frankly, on, on the work and the work that they did. And I thought, as I said, so important, an important moment, quite frankly, in the Reich's history, which is why I found a way in the middle of a pandemic to actually sneak snuck in for a day or two to just make sure I could see it. Um, because I think of the of the importance and the work that I know uh, that was put into it by the um, by, by the curatorial team. I have not seen the Mass P exhibition, although, to be frank, I have read the, I read the catalog. 
um, um, and that, but I want to say uh, two or two things about that, and then um, you know, then stop because I have ten because I was given ten minutes. The first thing is that this is, a, in my view, one of the most important exhibitions that has been done around um, around Afro Atlantic life. Um, it is uh, for many of us. It has a um, it has a voice. The, the voices, um, both of the art and of, and of the objects. Um, they are voices uh, essentially which talk about the uh, the, in, the international the Afro Atlantic experience of um, of Black folks. In it are pieces, but I'm from the Caribbean that they were they're, they're Caribbean pieces. In it that I you know because I've read the catalog um, that that come from a major show in the Caribbean in New York and uh, and and so that was you know and particularly the piece on Barrington. Piece from Barrington Watson, which I would, I you know, which, which struck me immediately since that's where I'm from. Um, it, it took it it represented a real breath, in my view, of um, of, 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 of 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 the Afro-Atlantic world. What is important, I think, about this was this exhibition um, is was that it wasn't trying to tell the story of slavery or the story of colonialism, but it actually was actually it was trying to. To using the voices of the of artists and others to tell a particular to tell to tell of the international what I would like to call the human black experience that to me is what is distinctive of what's distinctive and that what that meant is that therefore the show um, in terms since we're talking about ruptured histories the show then and I, again I haven't seen it I will see it when it comes to DC hopefully even though it's a condensed version. But what I think the show was, from what I've read in the catalog, what I think the show was able to do was to open a space for those of us who are trying to think about how to do certain kind of exhibitions from the perspective of those who have been racialized and those who have been colonized. That to me is the, is, is, is the, is the singular importance of, 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 of this particular show, the opening of that space, not just in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, but actually the, the opening of our space internationally for those of us who are trying to think through these questions. So let me stop there. Thank you very much for that response. Very thought provoking. Um, and I'm not going to go into discussion about it now because we'll wait and have the discussion as soon as we have heard from now. Um, Babaka Mbai Diop holds a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Rouen in France. He is currently Associate Professor of Philosophy at Chik Anta Diop University in Dakar. He is the author of numerous books and articles on African arts, um, former Secretary General of the Biennale of Contemporary African Art in Dakar, that was Dak Art, and he is a member of the International Association of Art Critics um, and is an independent curator. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, where you are. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, Daniel, for Daniel, for, uh, for having associated me uh, of this meeting. Uh, I have not uh, seen the exhibition of my colleague, uh, uh, Valika and Adriano, uh, but uh, they comment so that uh, it is very interesting. Uh, thank you for uh, my colleague uh, Anthony uh, for uh, his comment. Uh, my English is not uh, perfect, uh, so I will speak in French. Uh, I will apologize uh, to those uh, who don't understand uh, French. Uh, I hope uh, Daniel uh, can. Uh, can be uh, a, a, a translate uh, what I say. Uh, je vais donc parler en français, uh, s'il vous plaît. Uh, je vais juste commencer par uh, donc partager un document. Partager un document, voilà. Uh, mon propos donc c est, c est, c est, va axer sur trois parties. La première partie, je vais parler de la maison des esclaves. Euh, après euh, cette méthode d'esclave euh, dont je vais parler brièvement, je vais te poser une question. 
euh, sur le rôle de l'art contemporain, le rôle que l'art contemporain peut jouer dans la compréhension de l'esclavage et de cette maison des esclaves. Euh, L'impact sur le public, si vous voulez que l'exposition sur cette maison des, des esclaves, mais surtout que peut-être le point de vue des critiques d'art ou du commissaire d'exposition que je suis. Interroger euh, l'histoire de la tête négrée au Sénégal, c'est naturellement donc parler de l'île de Gorée, qui est considérée, euh, qui est considérée donc, euh, comme un des symboles emblématiques de la mémoire de la tête négrière. Euh, l'île de Gorée fut prise euh, par les Portugais euh, dès 1444, qui en firent une escale pour la route des Indes. Donc, ce que j'écris ici sur le tableau, le Portugal est là, donc il fallait aller sur la route des Indes et Gorée est là. Donc, Gorée est juste là et donc était, si vous voulez, une escale pour les Portugais. Après les Portugais, donc, les Hollandais s'y installèrent en 1627 et construisirent deux forts, deux forts pour le commerce de la traite négrière. Les Français l'occupèrent en 1677 et Gorée devient ainsi euh, un entrepôt d'esclaves et de marchandises des compagnies européennes et la porte de l'enfer pour des millions d'Africains. Au XVIIIe siècle, la période la plus intense de la traite, les Français et les Anglais disputèrent la possession de, de Gorée et ce jusqu'au début du XIXe siècle, quand Gorée avait, euh, si vous voulez, perdu euh, tout son intérêt pour les Anglais suite à l'abolition de, de, de l'esclavage. Vous savez que euh, dans les colonies britanniques, dans les colonies anglaises, donc l'esclavage le, le, a été aboli en 1834, donc bien avant dans les colonies françaises. Ainsi donc, euh, euh, de 1536, euh, date des premières esclaveries euh, euh, portugaises, en 1848, date de l'abolition euh, euh, par la France dans les colonies donc, françaises, pendant donc trois siècles, trois siècles sans répit, euh, traqués, sachés, arrachés à leur terre euh, natale euh, sous la torture des millions d'Africains de toute l'Afrique de l'Ouest ont quitté Gorée euh, et déportés aux Amériques euh, pour travailler dans les exploitations de coton, de café, de tabac et de cire. Et toutes les bordures, euh, toutes les, là je n'ai pas la carte de Gorée ici, mais euh, toutes les bordures, toutes les maisons en bordure de Gorée étaient en fait d'anciennes esclaverie, euh, là où on gardait les esclaves. Et selon l'ancien conservateur de la maison d'esclaves, Doudou Doudou Ndiaye, il y en avait 28. Il y avait 28 esclaveries, 28 maisons, si vous voulez, d'esclaves à Gorée. La dernière, qui est peut-être la plus importante et la plus connue, c'est celle qui nous concerne aujourd'hui dans ce propos. Et donc, elle serait construite, comme je l'ai dit au début, en 1776. Et donc, ah, ah, voilà Gorée. J'ai oublié. Donc, toute la côte de Gorée, toute cette côte-là, il y avait des, 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 des esclaveries. Et donc, euh, il y avait 28 maisons d'esclaves ici au, au, tout, pour toute la côte. Et voilà euh, la maison qui nous concerne. La maison des esclaves, l'actuelle maison des esclaves, parce qu'il y en avait 28. Et donc, euh, cette, euh, cette, euh, cette maison a été ici peinte euh, par Astral de Rivedou, euh, qui est un peintre, un, un capitaine d'atelier de marine, un peintre. Euh, donc français, et cette gouache est conservée au département de cartes et plans de la bibliothèque euh, donc, nationale en France. Et euh, ce tableau a été peint en 1839, euh, donc, donc euh, euh, si vous voulez, bien avant euh, l'abolition de l'esclavage dans les colonies euh, françaises. Et donc c'est un thème oculaire, un thème oculaire qui a peint la maison des esclaves. Et donc, euh, pour continuer, donc, et, et, euh, cette maison appartenait donc, à Anna Colas. Et donc, Anna Colas est une, est une métisse de Gorée. Et donc, les métisses, euh, les métisses sont, sont de ce genre-là. Donc, ce sont euh, souvent euh, des femmes euh, noires ou métisses, en tout cas, euh, ce qu'on appelle les signards, euh, dans les comptoirs de Rufus, mais aussi de Gorée et en fin donc, de Saint-Louis. Et. Euh, donc, ce qui est intéressant ici de savoir, euh, c'est que euh, Robert euh, Gaffio, dans son guide, dans son guide euh, de visite Gorée, capitale euh, d'Echi, précise que dans cette maison d'esclaves euh, était euh, parquée 
dans le bas enclos, à l'obscurité, sous les pièces réservées à euh, l'habitation des trafiquants. Le couloir, le couloir donc, euh, voilà, ici, la maison des esclaves, voilà. Vous avez ici euh, le, le couloir central. Le couloir central euh, dessert de droite, de, de droite à gauche une douzaine de longues et étroites cellules dans lesquelles de, les nombreux, euh, les malheureux euh, donc, étaient entassés et bien souvent enchaînés. L'autre extrémité, extrémité donc, du couloir donne sur la mer, c'est ici. Euh, le négrier avait ainsi toute facilité pour faire disparaître les, les cadavres de ceux qui ne pouvaient, euh, ceux qui ne pouvaient subir jusqu'au bout le supplice euh, de cette vie atroce. Euh, on ne peut pas parler de cette maison, bien sûr, sans parler de Joseph euh, euh, Gaï. Euh, je ne vais pas m'attarder sur lui parce que j'ai que 10 minutes. Euh, et donc, ce qui est intéressant ici de voir, euh, c'est que tous ces esclaves-là euh, euh, partaient vers les Amériques, euh, mais les prix de destination dépendaient des besoins des acquéreurs. Le père de l'esclave euh, pouvait, par exemple, être en Louisiane, euh, euh, à, aux États-Unis, la mère au Brésil et euh, l'enfant à Cuba, ou à Haïti, ou même aux Antilles. Et ils partaient de Gorée sous des numéros de matricule et jamais sous leur nom africain. Et donc, pour aller vite, la question que je me pose ici, donc avec cette maison des esclaves, avec l'histoire de l'esclavage, maintenant, quel est le rôle de l'art contemporain Le rôle de l'art contemporain, le rôle qu'il peut jouer dans la compréhension de, de l'esclavage et de cette maison même des de, 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 de esclaves. Que peut être l'impact sur le public pour une exposition sur cette maison des esclaves Et enfin, euh, que peut être le point de vue du critique d'art euh, Avec euh, des collègues euh, qui ne sont pas là aujourd'hui, je pense, euh, Moucher Maligagne et Mounir, et, et, Mounir Diallo, et quatre de mes doctorants euh, qui sont nous, avec nous, je crois, dans ce webinaire-là, Tafi Babadjo, Sambadou Kouré, Mamoussa Diallo et Alou Ndiaye, euh, qui nous a rejoint récemment. Donc, avec ce groupe-là de collègues, nous avons mis en place un groupe de recherche sur l'autre Gorée. L'autre Gorée, euh, c'est un projet en collaboration avec euh, des Allemands, des Camerounais et des Brésiliens dans le cadre de Africa Minty Cluster. Et Gorée, euh, nous euh, voulons raconter le Gorée qui n'est pas raconté euh, euh, donc dans les livres, le Gorée euh, non, non officiel. Euh, la question, c'est comment les populations de Gorée appréhendent-elles les récits officiels autour de cette maison des esclaves. Outre les récits officiels que nous connaissons tous de l'UNESCO, euh, voilà, euh, sur la maison des, des esclaves de Gorée, euh, comment la mémoire de, de l'esclavage est transmise donc, aux Sénégalais, mais, mais aussi aux Coréens Autrement dit, quels sont les récits Ça, c'est important. Donc, les récits des esclaves, euh, en dehors de la maison des esclaves, y a-t-il à Gorée des espaces vernaculaire qui rappelle la traite négrière et le commerce des esclaves. Euh, si je veux répondre à ces questions, à ces nombreuses questions en tant que curateur, en tant que commissaire d'exposition, je pense qu'il est important de partir des interprétations non officielles de la mémoire construite autour des récits oraux, des mythes, des légendes, la littérature, la peinture, la danse, les, récits, les arts visuels, la musique, le cinéma, etc. Afin de mener à bien ce travail curatorial, il est important de faire appel à des personnes ressources telles que les habitants de Gorée, euh, donc eux-mêmes, des conservateurs, des familles, des descendants d'esclaves, les griots aussi en Afrique qui occupent une partie, euh, en tout cas une part importante, les artistes de Gorée eux-mêmes, les intellectuels, les acteurs de la société civile et les associations. Euh, Qu'est-ce que Gorée ou la maison des esclaves aujourd'hui pour nous autres Pour nous autres. Et, 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 donc, la candidate pour nous autres, euh, qu'est-ce que Gorée ou la maison des esclaves pour nous qui ne, fûmes, qui ne fûmes ni victimes ni des témoins directs de la traite négrière. Pour ces quelques centaines d'habitants qui vivent à Gorée actuellement, qui n'ont pas du tout connu la traite négrière et ses conséquences immédiates, quelle image symbolique projette-t-il sur cette maison d'esclaves qui a été euh, l'horreur euh, dans toutes ses formes Donc voilà autant de questions, je pense, qu'un curateur doit se poser. Euh, s'il veut vraiment euh, euh, étudier cette maison d'esclaves et surtout ne pas euh, se baser uniquement sur les récits officiels. C'est bien d'écouter les populations euh, pour avoir leur avis. Euh, parce que simplement, ceux qui habitent Gorée font partie de la mémoire vivante de l'île, en ce sens qu'ils portent en eux les traces, les traces d'individus du passé 
en fut reçu donc, en héritage. Et si, et si on leur donnait la parole Et si on donnait la parole à ces Goréens, à ces habitants de Gorée, à ces descendants donc, esclaves, qui nous racontaient un peu euh, donc, de, de ce qu'ils pensent de, euh, à, à l'esclavage Et sur ce point, euh, sur ce point donc, et c'est là que je vais finir, euh, sur ce point, euh, il, faut que, je vous, il faut, je crois, euh, il y a un travail important, un travail remarquable de l'art praticien euh, Lamine Barreau. Lamine Barreau est un artiste praticien donc, au Sénégal euh, qui a travaillé sur la mémoire euh, de Gorée, sur la mémoire de, de, de l'esclavage, euh, sur, sur une belle exposition à, à l'époque qu'il avait appelée donc Gorée euh, sur la route de l'esclavage. Et euh, Lamine Barreau ne, ne s'est pas contenté uniquement des, des récits officiels. Il ne s'est pas contenté uniquement euh, des, des écrits officiels. Il est allé enquêter. Il est allé euh, donc demander à la population euh, leur avis sur l'esclavage, leur avis donc sur le Gorée. Et je pense que c'est important. L'artiste raconte euh, l'esclavage par l'art de l'installation. L'artiste retrace euh, des thèmes des différentes euh, étapes de l'histoire de la terre négrière. Il convoque dans cette œuvre monumentale plusieurs disciplines artistiques, la peinture, les figurines, la céramique, la photographie, les maquettes de bateaux, celles des, euh, des édifices, des outils et de l'île de Gorée et même des rudiments. Il convoque une grande donc, diversité de matériaux comme le bois, la terre, la, euh, le verre, le, la cire, le métal. Une documentation écrite et une iconographie riche, complète le dispositif de cette installation. Voilà, à mon avis, une manière de penser l'histoire. Voilà, à mon avis, une manière de penser, en tout cas, une autre manière de penser l'histoire, une autre manière de penser le travail, une autre manière de penser Goré. Et là, c'est vraiment des œuvres de Lamine Barreau que vous voyez ici. Vous voyez ici des, des, des esclaves enchaînés. Et c'est un, euh, un travail de plus de 7000 pièces qu'il a réalisé sur voilà, euh, le travail. Et là, on voit bien euh, les esclaves enchaînés. Là, donc, Rébellion et Marty, ce sont les esclaves qui se rebellent. Et, euh, et euh, là, euh, ils il, il, il montrent comment les esclaves euh, rebelles ont été donc, torturés. Là aussi, on voit la, la chasse des euh, esclaves. Euh, le captif, euh, les captifs dans les champs euh, voilà, de, 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 de plantation. Euh, là, c'est les embarquements euh, quand ils quittaient Gorée euh, pour aller donc, vers les Amériques. Euh, là aussi, c'est un, une autre œuvre qui s'appelle l'embarquement. Et là, on voit des personnes euh, voilà, qui tentent voilà, de, de fuir et qui euh, euh, tombent dans l'eau. Et souvent, ils sont mangés par les requins. Par les requins. Donc, en proie aux requins, toutes ces personnes-là, il y en a des millions d'Africains de, euh, qui ne sont pas arrivés euh, aux Amériques, simplement. Ils ont été euh, en, par, par la mer, mais surtout, ils ont été euh, mangés euh, par les requins. Et ça aussi, voilà, si vous voulez, les châtiments, à chaque fois que euh, les artistes se rebellaient, il y avait souvent des châtiments. Voilà un peu, j'ai été très vite parce que euh, j'avais que 10 minutes euh, donc de communication. Donc, euh, pour résumer, et je finis par là, je pense que euh, c'est important, à mon avis, euh, d'aller de, au-delà des récits officiels, d'aller au-delà des récits de, de l'UNESCO, des textes officiels et d'aller demander la parole aux populations pour un projet créatoral de ce genre. Je vous remercie. OK. I'll try. I don't see anything. Euh, non, euh, I'm finished. Yes, yes, I, I know that you are finished. But uh, I'm just, do you hear me? Dakar, euh, vous, ah, vous devez euh, et, en et, fait et, euh, arrêter ouais. le partage. D'accord. C'est en bas. bas. Oui, ou bien, ou bien peut-être laisser quand même, parce que comme ça, on voit au moins les heures. C'est peut-être plus arrêté. intéressant que ma tête. <rire> euh, je vais essayer de faire de mon mieux, parce que ce ne sera pas simple de, de traduire euh, en si peu de temps. Euh, et, euh, well, uh, sorry, I'm just going on in French. It's not, uh, not the sense of that. Uh, Babacar just presented uh, the island of Gorée, and uh, especially one house, uh, because... Um, Uh, this isle was uh, 
in very important for first for the Portuguese who occupied it since 1544 uh, uh, to the wood to occupy uh, as a scale uh, uh, to the wood to India. And uh, in 1627, the Hollandese came, built up two forts um, uh, to uh, uh, gather uh, the, the slaves here. And then the French came and um, made the same thing. And the English uh, wanted also that place. So it was a big debate uh, uh, to have this place. And as England um, gave up slavery in 1834, the last ones to occupy it were the French until 1848, 84, uh, 48, sorry. 48. <clears throat> and uh, it's, of course, uh, a horrible uh, story. You saw that beautiful house where a Metis woman, uh, Anna Colas, um, lived. And underneath, uh, there were the slaves, uh, which were detained until they were distributed uh, to the most bidding ones. So uh, people, <clears throat> uh, the families were uh, parted as we also know from the exhibition uh, of um, um, slavery and uh, the people, children uh, and uh, husband and woman were parted and uh, um, given to the most bidding uh, persons and uh, sometimes some went to uh, uh, America and uh, South America and others uh, went uh, to uh, India. Um, and what uh, he uh, would like to, uh, there is a, a, uh, uh, this, the, the, the picture you have seen is from Astrel de Rigdon, uh, that was a French one and it was made in 1839, and it's, uh, he was a, a visual uh, a testimony, a testimony, but he asked, what can we do now and what is our view uh, of today and how can we have uh, something else than this official uh, uh, speech and uh, what we know from, from books and from pictures and um, he um, organized with um, uh, his students, a group um, who is a group of research uh, of how through uh, the testimony of, um, of descendant of slaves and of people living on Gore and um, 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 people who have and artists uh, of the region uh, who have uh, this history in mind and as living memory and as oral memory. And uh, he is researching this and to acquire another view um, um, uh, of, the, um, of what it was and how, which impact it can have on the public today. And uh, if I understood well, he uh, is, uh, this group is uh, made of people of Gore, but also from Germany, from Africa and from Brazil. And um, the main thing is how can we um, transmit a memory, an oral memory, because most of the slaves had no possibility to write. And, um, he just uh, quoted this one artist, Lalil um, Boré, uh, Barré, Barry, uh, who made these big installations that you um, probably can see now because uh, he shared the, the picture and which depicts all the forms of, um, of lived uh, slavery as it is uh, rendered by uh, the people who um, have heard about it today. I think it's about what I said. Did I, did I translate you, um, Babacar? Do you understand it approximately? C'était à peu près ça? 
Est-ce que j'ai oublié quelque chose d'important? Babacar, il faut, il faut unmute, il faut, faut euh, mettre votre microphone et un est muté. Caroline, can you unmute uh, Babacar? Carolina? Ask to unmute, yes, yes. Voilà. Voilà. Daniel, is it correct? Thank you. Bon, <laughs> j'ai fait de mon mieux. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank Comme je n'avais pas de papier, c'était difficile. <laughs> mais, vous, mais vous avez bien résumé. Merci. D'accord. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Babaka, and thank you, Daniel, also for the translation. Um, and I wonder, Babaka, if you would mind not sharing your screen. That's perfect. Thank you yeah. very much, everybody. Before we open the questions to, to the um, audience, Can I just ask Valika and Adriano if they would like to make any comments on the respondents um, that you've just heard? Yes, uh, I would. Good. Would you like yeah, to go Okay. First? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, well, it's a pity that uh, Professor Bogus had to leave, but he raised such uh, uh, gorgeous points to discuss and to uh, think about further. Because, yes, Um, one of the things he said that um, the narrative represent is much more a complication of the narrative than a rupture of the narrative. That is absolutely uh, true because one of the challenges we posed is um, how to work with this building, this uh, um, in the National Museum of uh, Art and History and how to work with these objects and, and how to put our own collection in a new light. Um, so he, uh, that made it more difficult, of course. It is um, aimed towards a very broad audience, people from all different kinds of backgrounds. So um, in the exhibition, we are trying to look for this balance between all those different voices all at once. So yes, that, that makes it really um, uh, difficult at times. And he spoke specifically about the collar, which is an intriguing object, of course. And he said, how do you not repeat the violence? And I would like to speak about that because um, and it, actually it was a very important object to us to bring uh, forward because of this ongoing conversation in the Netherlands about a tradition which is called Black Pete which is uh, an annual uh, uh, commemoration uh, in which gifts are uh, presented. And uh, uh, the figure of Black Pete is actually a reference to all those boys you see in the paintings uh, in a, a servant uh, position. So by bringing this story with this color and by bringing uh, um, the uh, narrator with it, which is a white woman who is a direct descendant of an African young boy who was brought into the Netherlands in the 17th century, we were able to humanize it in such a way that we think that this really uh, will help forward uh, this debate going on in the Netherlands that is actually uh, about one group against the other group, about uh, uh, Can we speak about the shame of the, the white uh, um, people in the Netherlands? Uh, and should we address this colonial history? <clears throat> um, and by humanizing it, and at some point making it really visual, really uh, tangible through that color, for example, we were able to bring it closer to uh, uh, the sentiments of one and all, I think. So I think that was really important. And yes, violence in a, a slavery exhibition is something that has to be weighed continuously. Because there were also a lot of people that said to us, you should have made it more uh, uh, poignant. There, there should be more violence in there. But we actually chose to uh, make it much more about the personal stories. And in the personal story, I think, uh, Uh, the violence is always something that happens to you. It's not something that defines you. So we wanted to bring that, that uh, the way that people thought about themselves closer to the people. And that was mostly done through oral history. 
So that was an important uh, uh, part of the exhibition. Thank you. That's a very sensitive um, way of approaching it, I think. Um, Adriano, would you like to say something now? Uh, yes, also uh, very briefly, because I don't, I know we don't have a lot, a lot of time left, but uh, thank you so much for these responses and these presentations. Also, um, was interesting to hear uh, Barry Moore speak about the importance of representing the human Black experience that he saw in the exhibition, well, the publication of the exhibition, since he didn't see it, but at least the catalog. And um, I recall a colleague, Mari Carmen Hamidis, from the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, who came to see the exhibition when it had just opened. And she said, this is really, really ambitious. And I mean, people have been speaking about doing this, but people are just too afraid of getting, you know, having lacunas, having contradictions, have everything that you were, that your team was not afraid to do, you know? And uh, uh, definitely, as I had said, there are, there are overlaps, there are contradictions, there are things missing. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of excess as well. And there's, that's why also this second iteration of the exhibition um, that we see now three years later, opening in October in Houston is in fact much more concise. Um, um, there's only six sections, for example, and less than 200 works. So, um, but I think it, you know, this, the notion of histories that we're working with already historias in Portuguese, histoire in French, historias also in Spanish has the same type of understanding or this possibility leaves this, all this more open and gives it a more speculative, uh, provisional uh, quality that we think is interesting. Um, I think that's what I would have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both of you for your for your wonderful speeches and your responses to the respondents. Um, I've noticed a couple of chats in the um, list, the, the chat box. And the first one that came in is actually a, a question for Valika. And it's from Sarah Tangi, I think it's the, the name. And she says, did your visitor numbers go up and did it diversify significantly as a result of your show on slavery? And did the museum conduct visitor interviews? I presume she means, did, did, did you have a more diverse um, um, population coming to the exhibition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, because of course, due to the COVID, we were not able to <clears throat> receive the number of visitors that we have, would have loved to receive. So that was uh, a, a, the difficult part of this all. But at the same time, due to COVID as well, we had to work on an online um, experience of the exhibition and that is really well visited. Um, so yes, the number of people with a um, <clears throat> background directly related to descendants of slaves, that really grew. Um, uh, there were 60% of the people, 16, percent of the people uh, uh, said that they were related to uh, uh, enslaved people. And that was never before seen in uh, the uh, museum. So that to us was really important. And I think the whole um, uh, layout of uh, the, the whole organization, the whole transparent way of working and, and bringing so many voices to the fore in the media, for example, that really helped in raising that uh, percentage of people uh, that were new to the museum. Um, what was the second part of the question again? I can't hear you. So sorry. <laughs> sorry, my fault. Um, it was, um, did the museum conduct visitor interviews? Oh, no, we didn't do that, but I showed you the part where their two artists were, where their team, 
So they yeah. were there during the whole three and a half months and spoke to everybody who came there. So there were a lot of conversations and people could leave their um, impressions on those statues. So actually, instead of writing it down in books or, or speaking to one person, we invited people to speak to each other as well and speak uh, um, uh, to the team of uh, um, artists there. So yes, and also another um, factor was COVID. We could not do a big opening night. So the curators were there um, receiving everybody who was involved one by one. So we spoke to a lot, a lot, a lot of people. So, and, and I think if you look at the media, it is really clear that the discussion in the Netherlands has really moved in this period from the discussion of whether or not to discuss this to the embrace um, of this team and um, uh, really take the next step in it, see the humanity in the other uh, uh, party in, uh, in all of this. So I think that that really helped, yeah. Super, thank you. Um, the other question that was here is actually from Robert Young. Would you like to ask your question yourself or shall I read it? You have to unmute yourself if you want to speak, Robert. Okay, he's not unmuting, so I'm going to read his question. Um, no, 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 it's okay. I, it's okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, um, I noticed in the uh, slavery exhibition, so this is the question for Valika, uh, that uh, there is an emphasis uh, on, let's say, the aesthetics. And, uh, well, you, you already told us that the, uh, the whole uh, setup uh, the, the, the physical setup of the exhibition is of importance uh, for the, let's say, uh, the understanding um, of, uh, of, uh, of what is exhibited. Uh, but what struck me is that it, it, it had such a measure of aesthetics and even these glass beads uh, were hung in such a way that you thought, well, this is beautiful. And uh, the other... Um, Oh yes, of course. The commission uh, to the uh, uh, to the um, uh, uh, to the artist uh, to produce uh, this, let's say, this boat uh, out of these uh, petrol uh, cans. Well, uh, so the question is: the point is, uh, what was the added value of contemporary art and this, well, sometimes over overtly uh, aesthetic aspect of the exhibition? Um. Good question. I think it has a lot to do with what people expect of the Rijksmuseum, and we did not want to do it any less uh, in this case because it is a difficult subject. Um, we worked with this wonderful designer, Afaina de Jong, who was the, the genius behind the, the gorgeous colors and, and the, the mirrors and the, and the walls she put up. So um, it is something that came through the whole process, working together um, in wanting to bring that human aspect to, uh, uh, to the front so that it would not be dark and, and, and heavy only, but it would also be a celebration of the courage of those people, um, what they were able to do. It is also why we chose to do five stories about the system and five story of resistance and what I noticed a lot of people I talked about, for a lot of people, this history is not something they learn about in school. So it is completely new to them. So they go through the first few galleries and they are completely blown away and very tired. And they tell me, I'm going to come back some other day because this is just too much for me. But for the people who knew more already, they, they want to go on to that second part. They want to go to that celebration. They want to see their own humanity mirrored in those uh, people of those days. So I think the aesthetics were a very strong part of um, us trying to say, we as a museum want to do aesthetics and ethics at the same time. There's is not a contradiction. And I think it helped a lot of people who were afraid of coming to the museum and afraid of seeing 
this heavy uh, uh, history and, and, and were wondering what this um, building would do to that history, that they were very much uh, uh, inspired by the, the liveliness of uh, the way we uh, brought it. So I think, yeah, it was uh, an, an important part of telling this history in such a way that it would bring people together, that it would make them proud, and that it would um, uh, not be uh, just about the question of uh, guilt and shame, which was something that a lot of people were worrying about. Thank, Thank you, you much. Monica. There was actually another question in my chat box from Jan, uh, Robert Jan, who I, which I thought he was going to ask, and it's actually for Adriana Pedrosa. Oh, yes, uh, he says, could Mr. Pedrosa say something about a more long lasting legacy of the Afro-Atlantic histories for the permanent museum collection, its display, research and collecting? Did you get that? Um, yeah, I was reading, um, sorry, is it Emil Seneval, the question? Sorry, that's yeah, when you went into the that, question, I, I immediately I, went to that one. Yeah, I, I can repeat the question, shall oh, I? Oh, sorry about that, because I was reading the, you know, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I saw that. No, yeah, but um, <laughs> no, no. Uh, well, um, I, I wrote, uh, could uh, Adriana Pedrosa say something about a more lo long lasting legacy of the Afro Atlantic histories um, um, exhibition uh, for the permanent museum collection and then its display, its research and collecting? Because I know the um, uh, the MASP uh, has a very broad uh, collection, a uh, very important collection, also very important European uh, art from the, uh, I think, late 19th century, beginning of 20th century. But um, th this is a totally new turn for the, uh, I, I guess, uh, for, the, for the museum. Could you say something about those really museum, um, museum aspects like displaying, research, collecting? Right, of course, yes, thank you so much. Wonderful question, very important indeed, because temporary exhibitions, we put a lot of energy, um, a lot of resources, and there's a lot of attention around that a particular exhibition over the course of four months in that year and what happens afterwards, no? So I think for us, definitely all these histories exhibitions, it, they are always uh, an extraordinary opportunity for us to make acquisitions. You know? So in fact, within the Afro-Atlantic Histories exhibition, as I, I, as I showed you the very last slide that I showed uh, of our picture gallery, the very first row, all those works were uh, acquired in relationship either to Afro-Atlantic Histories, the, the group exhibition itself, all the other solo shows that year, because when we do the, the one sort of group exhibition, the other eight or nine or 10 exhibitions are also devoted to that topic, but they are monographic exhibitions. And uh, in fact, what happens recently when we, uh, ever since last year, when we started to actually um, finalize the arrangements of bringing Afro-Atlantic histories to the US, where it goes now in October, we realized that we would be, after so much effort of bringing so many works by Black artists to the collection, we would be depleted of them, so many, of so many of them, because they would be on loan for three years for this exhibition. So again, even now, we're still um, always bringing works to the collection. And in fact, we have a rubric. When we acquire the work, we always say what the context of the acquisition was. So if you go to MASPI, if, uh, if you see the labels or if you look up online, it will say this work is acquired in the context of uh, Afro-Atlantic Histories Exhibition 2018. So there is a very definite, important uh, imprint uh, of the exhibition in the collection, there's this residue that stays, and we really do call attention to it also in the cataloging, in the caption itself. So yes, very important indeed. And I uh, also responding, I guess, somehow um, to the question of audience also, 
Uh, our audience changed enormously over that year. Uh, when we, we usually have once a week, we have um, free admissions. During uh, Afro-Atlantic histories, we decided to do, to do free admissions twice a, a week. Our, uh, our staff also changed. As I said, now we have five colleagues that are Afro-Brazilians working with us in the curatorial departments, whereas before we didn't have any, basically. So, I mean, a lot of things have changed and uh, will continue to change, really. And this is something that we see also related to feminist histories, bringing women artists, indigenous histories, bringing indig indigenous artists is very much part of the program. Yeah, I hope I replied to your question. Thank you. Karen, <clears throat> Karen may I draw your attention that Nilo for put a question and she didn't, she didn't know if she, you received it. You are mute. Sorry, I'm, I'm obviously tired, <laughs> falling apart here. Um, yes, I saw Nilofer's question, but there was one that was before Nilofer from Emil Senewald. Um, and there's another one afterwards, and it is for uh, five o'clock. So I'm wondering, are we allowed to continue for another 10 minutes? For me, yes. I must ask Carolina, are we allowed to continue a bit? Yes, we are. We, we, we've got a little bit more time. Okay, fantastic. So the, the one that came in before Nilofer is, um, and there's also one from Baba Kadiop, and there's somebody with their hand up. So we've got four or five questions to go. Um, so here's a question to Adriana Pedrosa, taking up on Anthony Bogue's remark on the multi-voice dimension of this exhibition. Not having seen it, I wonder how you did mediation and pedagogical work to get it accessible and digestive in a way for a broader public. I'm asking this in regard to the enormous number of pieces and documents, which often create an experience of being overwhelmed and thus leading to a reflex of avoiding instead of digging its way in. Okay, did you get that? Yes, I did. That was a question I had for, uh, ah, previously. Okay. And in fact, I'm afraid I will have to, to leave very soon as well. So I don't know if I'll be able to cover all the, the questions that are wonderful questions that are coming up. But I, regarding that, yes, that's also something, that's always something that is very much a concern of ours. The exhibition was indeed quite uh, crowded, um, but it was spread out over um, three galleries, all the gallery spaces basically at the museum, as well as two gallery spaces in another venue, uh, the Instituto Tomiotaki. So it was quite spread out. But we also, I can't remember now, but I mean, the very sort of sh uh, extended label short texts that we do was something that we worked quite a lot on that to make it accessible, to make it didactic. Not all the, the, the works, of course, had these didactic labels, these extended labels, but many of them did have these, these explanations. Um, and it's something that we take quite seriously. Uh, also, we did a series of uh, in, uh, short uh, interviews and videos with uh, many of the living artists, mostly Brazilian artists, um, um, that were participating in the exhibition. And of course, also uh, different types of public programs, workshops, both at mediation projects, both at the museum as well as the Instituto Tomiotaki. But it does have this polyphonic quality somehow, you know, uh, all, at times maybe uh, uh, verging into the cacophonic quality. But yes, I think uh, it's something that we see, we saw a lot of people coming back and going through these short texts and taking photographs. And of course there's, a, there's le levels of engagement that you can have in an exhibition uh, like this one. No, I hope I answer the question. Great, thank you very much. Um, there's another one for both you and Vanika. If you've got time to answer it before you have to leave. It says, uh, it's from Baba Diop. He says, if in their curatorial project, they asked Africans 
Afro-Americans, descendants of slaves, what they think about slavery, if they went beyond the official texts, did they interrogate myths, legends, and, and oral histories? That's for both of you. Who would like to answer first? Adriano, if you're in a hurry, maybe you should. Yes, yes. Um, I, uh, we did uh, try to look at that. May, mostly it will come up um, in, in the research, in the seminars, in the anthology. Um, but I should say that the focus was really, in terms of the exhibition, was the focus uh, was really visual culture and visual material. Uh, but of course, the document can be uh, a document can uh, be also part of that uh, wider panorama. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it another another important issue for us is that the of, although slavery did play an important role in these Afro-Atlantic histories, it's it wasn't the framework. You no, know? it wasn't the main framework. We started the project around slavery, but then we decided to unfold into something wider. Um, and in fact, that's a question that I would have if, uh, if the Reichs Museum project was somehow criticized for having an emphasis on slavery, because we moved away from that framework precisely after, you know, discussions that we, we had around our first seminar or after our first seminar in 2016, two years prior to the exhibition. I wonder if that came up at all in, uh, at the Rijks Museum. Uh, that's a good question, yes. Um, no, not at all. It was the other way around actually, because we are a, a museum that have mostly uh, brought uh, exhibitions on white topics. This was the first time ever we talked about uh, uh, colonial slavery. And it was preceded by just one other exhibition on a colonial topic, which was in exhibition on South Africa. So this was the second one. And actually the question that was posed mostly was the question, why is it about colonial slavery? Why is it not about Arabian slavery, Roman slavery, modern slavery? Um, a lot of people did not want to that confrontation with uh, Dutch history uh, in the colonial uh, era. So I think our biggest uphill um, uh, um, part of the project was that um, explaining why it is so important in a European country that was part of uh, the colonial enterprise of the colonial slavery history to speak specifically to colonial uh, history, colonial slavery history. And uh, um, there was actually uh, the most pushback was about uh, our uh, insistence that there is a direct line between um, problems with race and uh, et cetera today, uh, problems with segregation in schools and, and, and livelihoods, et cetera, and knowing more about slavery history. So, um, our uh, 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 permanent, how would you say that, the visitors that are uh, mostly connected to the Rijks Museum, to them this was completely new, which makes it a completely different situation. Thank you, thank you both of you. Um, I have one very quick question from Aliou, um, who would like to ask it verbally. And um, we, we maybe will still fit in. That's okay. And then I think we're running out of time. Aliou, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for this meeting. And uh, uh, just like to Babakar, I'm a French speaker, but uh, I will try to speak in English, maybe uh, because I will be very, uh, very quick. Just uh, two questions. A two question about the exhibition of uh, the 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 Risk Academy Museum, and uh, one question for Valika and 
recently I, I was in, uh, in Amsterdam and I see that you have uh, um, uh, a very big uh, number of uh, Suriname's artists, artists coming from Suriname, the, 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 the community of Suriname, Suriname people, uh, we can see many uh, people uh, uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, mm -hmm. I, I say, and uh, did in your project, uh, did you plan to, to integrate this part of this community uh, who, who was in, uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam, in uh, uh, Netherlands, in the Netherlands, <coughs> and uh, also I know in Netherlands, every 1st July, you celebrate the, the, the abolition of, of slavery. Mm -hmm. Hasn't it, right? Yes. And uh, yes, did the, the, this, this artist community of uh, Suriname give something or some uh, and contribution for your project, for this project about slavery that you show in, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands? It, it is the, 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 the only question for you. The second one for Adriano. Adriano, uh, about the, the, your project, Histoire Afro-Atlantique, I, I see uh, one, one uh, works uh, showing that the maps of Africa uh, uh, that uh, we uh, to, to, to take the place of South, South America in the in, in the same in the same topic in the same uh, visual and that uh, usually people say that even if uh, we are talking about decolonization even if we talk about uh, visual arts this map of africa is not the real map it's not the real uh, um, uh, um, expression of the of the geography of africa it is the the the, the what do we say the, um, the the projection of mercator mercator okay because in reality africa is more biggest than what we show to people and it is a, a fashion always to 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 make the gaze of people about africa to 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 to, to reduce the, the 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 image of Africa because the projection of Mercator show the maps of Africa very very little um, um, according to his real real uh, geography and the real square. Okay, just just two question and I'm not to be um, uh, okay. It's good. Thank you. Thank you and. Uh, that's very easy for me. Right. If I can That's reply important. first very briefly, that is a work by, you're referring to the work by Hank Willis Thomas, where he replaces the image of South America, the map of South America for the map, the image of the map of Africa. Yeah. Um, it's, of course, it's a work of art, so it has some degree quite a lot of, you know, fiction and speculation and creativity around it. But I think it's more, I see it more, I understand uh, and appreciate your points, but I think it's more, uh, I read it more in terms of uh, Africa within South America, what, particularly in Brazil, which, you know, Africa um, um, uh, is so important uh, because we have, as I said, Brazil has the second largest African population mm -hmm. or black population after Nigeria. And we've received um, about 40% of the enslaved Africans coming over the course of several centuries. Brazil was the last country in the West to abolish slavery. So this is very much part of our culture, very much part of our history. So that resonates quite a lot at least for us, that, that the image of that map. But I understand it has different implications when you see it from a, from a US point of view, because Hank Willis Thomas is, after all, a US artist, a Black US, US artist living uh, in New York. Having said that, I hope this was the last question for me, because I'm afraid I have to leave. I have, I have to finish. Yes. OK, but I thank, thank you, you so all. Much.
for this opportunity and wonderful conversation to hear all of you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation. It was fabulous. Thank you. Okay, uh, Valika, are you going to respond to Aliu or can we just do one more, one more question from Nilafa, who's been very, very, very patient here. <laughs> okay, let's do that one last then. Yes. yes, and I can be very brief about the question that Aliu uh, asked. Thank you for bringing this forward. Absolutely. I mean, the Netherlands is a European country and um, a lot of people from Suriname have been uh, migrating to the Netherlands since the 60s of the last century. And they were actually the people who put this on the agenda that the Netherlands should come to terms with its slavery history. So actually this whole thing is the outcome of their lobbying, their voice, and throughout the whole project, they were involved in every, every part of it. So not just the contents of the exhibition, but every department in the museum, be it education, uh, communication and marketing, um, and, um, all uh, departments worked with people either on a temporary basis brought in or in their networks. So um, yes, they were very, very much part of this. Great. Thanks. Nilafa, it's your turn at last. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I have a question for uh, Valika. Uh, you, know, you mentioned that uh, you know, throughout the exhibition, some of the didactic text has been you know, recontextualized, uh, but it's only for a temporary time. You know, it, it's not going to stay, let's say, beyond the exhibition. Uh, why was that kind of decision taken? Because if there is an attempt to decolonize, uh, sorry, de, uh, yeah, uh, move towards decolonization of the space, uh, the museum, then would it be better? Why was such a decision taken that it should be only temporary? Oh, yes. Thank you for that question. Now, what we actually mean to do is to keep on decolonizing. So what we do now is add 77 texts throughout our whole museum, which is a, a uh, way of making people think. But it, it is still the, the, the first text is there and then a second text um, addressing slavery. So on, in the end, you would want a, one new text in Anthony Bogue's terms that really uh, uh, ruptures the narrative, that really brings in a new narrative. So that is what we're aiming for, not having two narratives next to each other, but to have one new uh, narrative. And actually we're working on a lot of, um, uh, could you call it emancipation um, uh, gulfs in the museum. We want to bring in more stories about women, for example. Uh, we want to bring in more stories about another big group in the Netherlands, which are the people with uh, background in Morocco and Turkey. So all of these new visions we want to integrate in our new texts. And actually we're struggling with texts that are just 60 uh, words uh, long. So we are experimenting and working with audio tours and other kinds of ways in which you can layer the uh, information that you give people and make it much more interesting for people with all different kinds of um, interests and backgrounds. There is always so much to say about an object and we try to put it in 60 words. So we have to choose them really wisely. And um, well, but also we, we need to change up the museum. Maybe it's not just about the text, but there should be more audio tours, for example, and, and other ways in finding and adding that information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, somebody, uh, Alia, uh, he's muted. Um, <laughs> right, have, have you answered the question, is everything finished? And may we say goodbye? And thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Splendid. Um, you very just, much. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here, for listening, and thank you mostly to our presenters who have just enriched our afternoon to such a degree. Um, and I'm, I'm actually going to, I believe it's going to be put onto YouTube. It's going to be available on the ICA website. So if you missed anything or you want to listen to something again, it's all there. And um, we hope you will all come to our next webinar. Um, so thank you very much and goodbye from all of us. Um, goodbye. Do you want to thank say you. goodbye, Danielle? Thank you. Goodbye. Thank goodbye. you. Yes. I just wanted also to, to, to thank the, the, uh, the wonderful presentations and it was very uh, innovative and I think it gives us also uh, with the, the questions of the audience, uh, the interest uh, on the topic and also um, that how it could go on uh, in the discussion and I think this was very well worthwhelm. Many, many thanks to you, Valika, uh, and uh, of course, uh, Adriano and uh, uh, Anthony, who are not here, and Babaka. Uh, it's uh, to you, Karen, uh, you made a great job. It was uh, wonderful. You, you helped us following uh, the whole situation. And uh, also to Carolina, who made the technical part and who is not on view. So thank you also to the whole committee who has, uh, who has uh, made a great job before and uh, will go on with the rest. And I just wanted at least to say all names. This is Adria, to the ones you already know. Uh, it is uh, Ad uh, Adriana uh, Almada, uh, Alfredo Ramarotti. Um, and uh, I think that was it because the others were named. And um, we look forward to have you uh, uh, on our next meeting. It will be in March. Uh, and we will, if you are interested, you can apply for a newsletter of us, even if you are not uh, from ICA, uh, if you are not ICA members. Thank you and bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.